Welcome to Confessing the Faith, a theological and devotional walk through the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. I am your host, Sam Waldron, one of the pastors of Grace Reformed Baptist Church in Owensboro, Kentucky, and president of Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary. We come today to continue our study of chapter 12 of the Confession and the important subject of adoption. Last time I asserted the need to distinguish between adoption in the history of redemption and adoption in the application of salvation. In this podcast, I want to survey adoption in the history of redemption. Remember, this has to do with the people of God corporately in the history of redemption, and not specifically with adoption as one of the blessings we receive when redemption is applied individually to us. So here we're talking then about the accomplishment of redemption and not so much the application of redemption. Through these two dimensions of adoption, we will look at uh, the subject and see that they are both closely related and also that they must be distinguished. With regard to adoption and the history of redemption, three matters must occupy our attention. They are, first, the original status of sonship, the sonship of Adam. Two, the typical status of sonship, the sonship of Israel. And three, the substantial sonship or substantial status of sonship, the adoption of the church. First then, in this podcast, the original status of sonship, the sonship of Adam. The biblical word for adoption means literally placing as a son. Thus, no discussion of adoption which does not take into account the broader biblical teaching on the subject of sonship can be accurate. This teaching certainly begins with the idea that Adam was originally the son of God. This is explicitly stated in Luke 3, 23 and 38. In the genealogy of Jesus, uh, his uh, parentage is traced back to Adam, the son of God. It is also implied in a comparison of Genesis 1, 26 and 27 with Genesis 5, 1 to 3, where the idea of image bearing is intimately connected with that of sonship. So if Adam was the image of God, he was also in that way the son of God. This last thought reveals that the concept of sonship is not limited to status or legal relationship as we think of it in adoption. Status is, of course, the emphasis of adoption. Sonship, however, also involves the concept of a shared nature. Compare passages like John 5, 18 to 23 and John 8, 33 to 47. The witness of the Genesis account, as we look at Genesis 2, 17 and again 3, 24, and indeed the entire Bible is that this original relationship of sonship to God was lost when Adam fell. And thus, subsequent to the fall, The privilege of being a son of God is almost exclusively limited to those who are the objects of God's redemptive purposes and covenant dealings. Take passages like Genesis 6, 2, and Exodus 4, 22 and 23, and John 1, 12 and 13, all of which limit sonship, uh, being a son of God. Uh, to a smaller portion of the human race. It is, however, this original relationship with Adam which explains the occasional rare references to all men as somehow being God's descendants or offspring, compare Acts 17, 28, and 29, and perhaps Hebrews 12, 9. In the sense of deriving their existence from the Creator, and being in some sense the objects of his providential care, Acts 17, 25 to 28, men may still be described as God's son, but only only in this limited sense. The whole story of the Bible is the story of how mankind's original filial relationship with God as their father is restored through the work of Christ. It is only when men once again share the nature of God and are the objects of his special favor that they are, in the full sense, his sons. As John Murray trenchantly asserts, to substitute the message of God's universal fatherhood for that which is constituted by redemption and adoption is to annul the gospel. 
The story of adoption and the history of redemption begins with Adam as originally the son and now the fallen son of God. But that is not where it ends. Next time we'll consider the sonship of Israel and then the sonship of the church.